Oh God and our Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for tonight. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for the presenter. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for us who will be benefited from this presentation. Lord, we pray for your blessing tonight upon the proceedings. For we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, everyone. Ella Fegan is over to you when you... Okay, sir, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, greetings, Bishop Thorpe, um, Evangelist Thorpe. Evangelist McTavish. I don't remember, I see um, Shinari Brown. But all the brethren, I greet you in the name of the Lord. We have a very interesting topic to be presented and discussed tonight. Um, maybe we could do a little talking around until we reach about 10 persons, but we don't want to hang around too long. Because already we're in a starting early, so. But I will wait five more minutes to see if a few more brethren join. Okay. And um, as you can see on the screen, we will be looking at the management of strokes. All right, and I know that everybody knows about stroke. We hear people talk about it. They have relatives that have been affected by a stroke. And throughout the world, strokes are having a lot of, causing a lot of death and a lot of disablement of individuals because it is not really an easy thing to deal with, especially if it is severe. So management of stroke is the topic for tonight. Of All right, we have some areas that we want to look at. We want to look at the definition of stroke, type of stroke, causes and possible causes of stroke, some risk factors for stroke, complication of stroke, and the management of stroke. When I say we're talking about the medical management of stroke, that is what and prevention of stroke. So by way of definition, a stroke occurs when a blood vessel in the brain ruptures and bleeds. Uh, when there is a blockage in the blood supply to the brain. The rupture or blockage prevent blood and oxygen from reaching the brain's tissue. Without oxygen, brain cells and tissues become damaged and begin to die within minutes. So if somebody gets a stroke, If somebody gets a stroke, they need prompt attention. And um, the management of stroke in um, like a third world country, like Jamaica, would be a, a lot different from what happens in large countries, developed countries, because they have more resources. For instance, They have um, operating theaters that are dedicated to treat um, strokes. And they have um, diagnostic facilities that are dedicated to, to treat um, stroke. I can tell you of one hospital that I have visited a few times in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Grady's Hospital. 
they have a, an helipad or, or more than one on the 16th or 17th floor so that if somebody has an emergency like a stroke, a helicopter can take them and they are, they are quick time, they are sent to do imaging studies so that they can identify where the blockage is and where the bleeding is. And they can whisk them into theater quite fast. And the person who gets stroke can walk out within a few days. But that is personal management. In Jamaica, we do our best, but we don't have those sophisticated um, resources and equipment to, to deal with it that way. All right, so this picture is showing you, um, this is signifying a block blood vessel. And over here is bleeding inside the brain. Well, when it comes to bleeding inside the brain, the brain is in a confined space. Whenever you get a stroke, the, um, the head does not get bigger. It's the same confined space. And if you have continuous bleeding and it is not stopped, it is going to cause pressure on the brain and cause more brain tissue to die. And that is what eventually kills some people. When um, you have continuous bleeding and the bleeding is not controlled, and let me say, the, 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 our, our, our maker has really made us wonderful because the, 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 the brain is kind of unique in that the blood supply has a circle that goes around the entire brain that if one era should block off, it can travel at different areas. But if you have a very significant arch that is blocked, for instance, this big artery here, it can cause significant problems. This is another, another thing that can happen in the brain. This that I'm pointing to is called an aneurysm. And what is an aneurysm? An aneurysm is a weakened blood vessel where the muscular part of the, the blood vessel is absent for whatever reason, genetic reason, it is just absent. And then you have a weakened blood vessel that bulges. And when it bulges like this, if you have increased pressure, it can burst and um, you can have bleeding in the brain. This is actually like a time bomb and it is not only found in the brain, but you can have it in other parts of the body, aneurysm. In sophisticated jurisdiction, they can put a banner on it until they, they do surgery to remove it. So what are the type of strokes that are um, have been identified. There are three really primary types of strokes that have been identified. You have what they call a transient ischemic attack. By transient, we mean that it is not permanent. Ischemia means that um, it locks oxygen. And um, so it is a temporary period in which oxygen cannot pass, no blood is passing, either because the, the blood vessel become narrowed or you have a, a clot that blocks it temporarily. But this type of um, attack tends to reverse, to reverse on its own. 
if it goes on to be permanent, well, it is no longer temporary, but um, when you see, when you start to get transient attacks, the warning sign that bigger attacks could be coming. So the person would be told to go and get medical attention before it gets worse. All right, the second one, ischemic um, stroke involves a blockage caused by either clot or plaque. And by plaque, we're talking about fatty plaques. When we eat, um, you know, fast food and various things, and when we use what they call a certain type of, of um, product that they use in like biscuit and so on to make it last longer. And, and does that become rancid? It has this effect to cause plaques to form in the blood vessels. And what the plaques actually do is that they narrow the blood vessels. And you know that if you have a, a big pipe that is carrying water and you want to increase the pressure, all you need to do without increasing the amount of water that comes through the pipe, all you need to do is reduce the size of the pipe and the pressure will go up. And that is the same way um, if our blood vessels become reduced, our blood pressure will go up and it will make us susceptible to get things like stroke or heart attack. So the symptoms and complications of ischemic stroke can last longer than those of transient ischemic attack. I may become permanent. And last of all, you have what we call a hemorrhagic stroke, or the one where bleeding takes place in the brain and you get a stroke. So whatever causes the stroke, it can turn out to be um, the same consequence the same disability that the person will experience and the same problems with activities of daily living. All right, a transient, a transient ischemic attack is a warning sign of a, of a future stroke. Strokes and transient ischemic attacks require emergency care. So, not because they call it just a transient ischemic attack. You said, sure, I don't need to go to the hospital for a recover. You need to go to the so that you can be properly evaluated. And that um, you can, you can um, postpone future strokes because you don't know how often the ischemic attack will occur and how far advanced the blood vessels are as it relates to the clog or how much they are clogged up. So there are times when the blood vessels, up to half of the blood vessels or more could be clogged with fatty plaques and um, and what they call, so you have something that they call atherosclerosis. You don't have to remember that. An arteriosclerosis. So the blood vessels, apart from being clogged, they are not as elastic that can expand and coil and contract as when the person is younger. But they tend to become more hardened 
All right. Persons who know about um, PVC pipe and who know about galvanized pipe, you know that galvanized pipe tend to get corroded on the inside after many years. And it cannot carry as much water as it used to. On the other hand, PVC pipe tend not to clog up so easily. But the thing about um, blood vessels, we can change blood vessels. Blood vessels are what they are, and they will get clogged up based on your eating pattern and where we exercise and so on. As many as 10 to 15% of people will have a major stroke within three months. Sorry, 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 that bit. It's not Sophia. So, Sophia, please. Okay, thank right you. End of it. Okay, so thank you. So, we are saying that up to a third of people who have had a transient ischemic attack and don't get treatment will have a major stroke within a year. And if you're talking about a third, that is 33%. So if you have 100 person who get that transient ischemic attack, within one year without treatment, 33 of those persons will get a stroke. And as many as 10 to 15% of people will have a major stroke within three months of finding out that they have a transient ischemic attack. All right. Most strokes are ischemic type stroke. That means the one that you have blockage rather than bleeding. You have blockage in the brain, either from blood clot. And the thing about blood clot is that they can travel to far, far from far. They can travel from way down in your leg and go to your lung, or they can go further and go the piece of the, the clot, depending on how large it is, can break off and go and form another clot somewhere further leg in your brain. And um, that is why it is good that you don't have any clot at all. So if you have conditions that will predispose you to clotting, the doctor will have to put you on some things to prevent the blood from clotting. And the, the blood can clot, especially if the heart is not working well to pump the blood in and out. You have slow down of the blood and it leads to clotting. And as we said, fatty deposit also called plaques can also cause blockages by building up in the vessels over time. It does not happen one time, but as you continue to eat without care and eat fatty things, gradually the 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 they um, cleave onto the blood vessel and become plaques, and the plaques can break up and they become as dangerous as clot. All right, so we talk about hemorrhagic stroke. How does it happen? And a hemorrhagic stroke happens when an arch in the brain leaks blood. So you could have a full rupture, like what I show you with the aneurysm, or you could just have leaking of blood from the aneurysm or from some other blood vessel. And it could happen, and if your blood pressure should increase, then the force would cause it to break apart. And you get a full blown bleeding in the brain. The leak blood puts too much pressure on the brain cells, 
which damages them. High blood pressure, an aneurysm, balloon, like bulges, that is the, the, the aneurysm, they say balloon like bulges in the artery that can stress, stretch and burst are examples of condition that can cause a hemorrhagic stroke. So, although maybe only 20% or less of stroke are caused from bleeding in the brain, but yet when, when it happens, it can be very deadly. And when we talk about deadly, we are talking about either causing death or disability in somebody's part. Person might not be able to walk or so on, but we'll get to those complications. All right, this is showing another era where bleeding can take place, frontal lobe of the brain. And let me say, different areas of the brain have different functions. So like the frontal lobe of the brain here is um, useful for speech, both speech recognition, recognition and to help the person to speak. So if you should have bleeding or a clot anywhere in that part of the brain, it most definitely will affect the speech of the person. Another, another feature of the brain that we, when we get there we want to bring out is that um, the brain has two hemispheres. And what happened is that the, the things are the things that carry the brain impulses they cross over somewhere in, in the neck called the foramen of valley. So that if you have um, weakness on the right side of your hand, it is almost certain that the problem, the area where you have the problem is on the left. So if you if you if your right hand is having problems to move and to lift things, more than likely it is on your left hand that you got the stroke. Because as we say, you have crossing over of the, the, um, the tracks that carry information to and from the brain. What are some of the risk factors for stroke? Certain risk factors make a person more susceptible to stroke. According to the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, USA. Risk factors for stroke include, for instance, an unbalanced diet. And it can increase the risk of a stroke. This type of diet is high in salt, saturated fat, and trans fat. Well, trans fat is actually the worst of all these fats. What it stands for is transitional fat. So what they do, they have oil that they, they take to, through certain process, which is called hydrogenation. You don't have to remember that, but when they do, it causes the fat to last. It is really oil, you know, but they call it fat. And it lasts for an extended period and prevent like biscuit and so on to become rancid. If you use ordinary fat over time, the ordinary fat will become rancid. And you know that whenever anything is rancid, people don't want to eat it for it tastes bad. Some other risk factor, inactivity is a risk factor. So if you are eating up the big lunches and the big dinner, and you are not having any exercise, then it is saying that in time to come, and if you are putting on the weight in time to come, it is possible that you could get a stroke. Then we talk about um, 
heavy alcohol use. Christian don't use alcohol in a heavy manner. Tobacco use, Christian don't use that too, but since it is a presentation that anybody could listen, we include those things. You have personal risk factors like um, family background. So there are some risk factors for a stroke which we cannot control, such as your family history. They say black people and some Indian people are susceptible to get stroke. stroke. So if you come out of a black family, it might be easier for you to get it, but still, if you keep your diet under control and you remember that you need to get rest and exercise, your age, and it is said that men tend to get stroke more than women. And uh, if you are over 55, you are susceptible to stroke. Then we look at race and ethnicity. As I mentioned about the black race. And then if you are from different ethnic background in, in the black race, both in the diaspora, and um, if you if you check blacks who are living in certain parts of the world, they will be subjected to similar problems. Although, and especially if their lifestyle follow the lives of blacks in America, black in Jamaica you will get these type of, of these type of risk factors. Your health history could be a source of um, problem. If you have medical conditions, for instance, if you have had a previous stroke, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. And let me say, some people are waiting for blood pressure to give them a headache and so on before they run to the doctor. But let me say, Brett, um, if you have blood pressure and it's hard to give you a headache, it's very serious. But one of the reasons why they call um, hypertension the silent killer is that it can be killing you and you don't know. All right, so high blood pressure, high cholesterol, if you carry too much weight, it can be a source of problem. Heart disorder, um, disorders such as coronary artery disease can also cause it. What are some of the signs and symptoms of stroke? You can have paralysis. You can have numbness and weakness in the arm, the face and leg, especially on one side of the body. Trouble speaking or understanding others when they speak. You can have slurred speech. Confusion, disorientation, or lack of responsiveness. You could have sudden behavioral changes, especially increase agitation, and it can lead to depression too. All right, this is kind of the typical look of somebody who has had a stroke. Really, um, the face is kind of twisted to one side. If you look, you see that the, the face is twisted to, to the right side. All right, the person who suffers from stroke could also have vision problem, 
So she has trouble seeing in one or both eye, eyes, with vision blackened or blurred, or double vision. Could reach a stage where the person has trouble walking, could have loss of balance or coordination. Um, two parts of your body are important in coordination. That is a portion of the, of the ear. It's help you with balance. And of course, you will have dizziness, severe sudden headache, which is an unknown cause, seizures, nausea, and vomiting. So you have the feeling to vomit and you will actually vomit too. All right, how are stroke treated? Emergency treatment for stroke depends on whether the person is having an ischemic stroke or a stroke that involves bleeding into the brain, which we say is hemorrhagic stroke. To treat an ischemic stroke, doctors must quickly restore blood flow to the brain. And this may be done This must be done. They do it by giving certain medication. They, sometimes they can inject the, the medication direct to where they have the clot. And the, the medication will help to dissolve the clot. So they give emergency IV medication with drugs that can break up a clot. And they, have to, they give it like for within the first 4.5 or four and a half hours from when symptoms first started. And if given intravenously, the sooner as these drugs are given, the better. Quick treatment not only improves the person's mm -hmm. chances of survival, but also may reduce complication. So as I say, they can di directly deliver the medication to the brain. You can remove clot with a stent retriever. So when they check out after doing their diagnostic test, they see that um, there's a clot large enough that it can be removed. They will do that necessary process, medical process. To, to get um, the stent remover to the spot where it is needed. They can administer blood thinning medication to prevent blood clot. And I, I did not particularly want to call any name because some of the names are not easily called. And when it comes to these things, you need to go and get um, yourself checked out rather than trying to give home remedy. But you don't know what might be the outcome. So surgery, if, the, if it is caused from a hemorrhagic um, stroke, they will recommend surgery. If all the other indices are, are good, they will recommend surgery for the person and depending on how early it was found out. After you have gone through the first phase of recovery, I mean, when you, when the doctors rush you to emergency room and all of those things, after that treatment, the patient will be closely monitored for at least a day. After that, strokes care focusing on helping the client recover as much function as possible and return to independent living. 
All right, anybody can answer this. When we talk about independent living, what are we talking about? Return to independent living. Living without um, actually depending on any medication or anybody else assisting you, just normal. Thank you. Is that Sister Henry? Yes, yeah, so. Um, Sister Lisbeth. Yes, so independent living, that is what it is all about. You don't have to depend on people to do things for you. And you know, as much as you, you um, try to maintain those functions that you can do on your own, there might come a day when you can do what you would want to do. And then we say that you are not living independently. And we also say that the impact of the stroke will depend on the area of the brain involved and the amount of brain tissue that is damaged. If the stroke affected the right side of the brain, the movement and sensation on the left side of the body may be affected. If the stroke damaged the brain tissue on the left side of the brain, the movement and sensation on the right side of the body may be affected. Just like what I was saying a while ago. Brain damage to the left side of the brain may cause speech and language disorder because as I was telling you, there is, there is a area of the brain that controls speech and language that they call bocas area. I don't have to remember that, but the brain can be divided into segments for, for um, teaching purposes, but the brain works in a unitary manner. So we say that if the brain damage to the left side of the brain may cause speech and language problem. And if you are, if you are have a stroke and you can still talk, if it's not even so plain, but it's when you, you are there and can't talk nothing, that is the time that it becomes painful. All right, so we are looking at the different um, hemisphere of the brain, right here, the left and the right hemisphere. So this person is depicting that. If they should have problem on the left side, on the right side of the brain, the problems are going to be manifested on the left side, like with lifting of small objects and so on, they can do it again. On the other hand, this is showing an instance where the stroke would be on the left side and all the problems on the right side. All right, stroke recovery and rehabilitation. Most stroke survivors go to rehabilitation program. They go to a rehabilitation program. The doctor will recommend the most rigorous therapy program that, that one can handle based on one's age, overall brain health, um, overall health and degree of disability from the stroke. The doctor will take into consideration the caregiver, the person's lifestyle, not the caregiver, but the person's affected lifestyle, their interests, priorities, and the available 
availability of family members or other caregivers. In some families, they have adequate amount of uh, number of caregivers. In other families, they depend heavily on the state and don't have a lot of caregivers. So when we talk about caregivers, we're not talking about the ones that were paid by government. We're talking about family members who can assist. All right, coping with stroke. A stroke is a life-changing event that can affect the person's emotional well-being as much as the physical function. The person may sometimes feel helpless, frustrated, depressed, and apathetic. The person may also have mood changes and lower activity in one low activity in other body, bodily function. Sorry about that. What are some of the complications of stroke? A stroke can cause temporary or permanent disability, depending on how long the brain lacks blood flow and which part of the brain is affected. So complication may cause, may lead to paralysis. We had look at paralysis as one of the, yeah, the causes of a stroke. But the, the paralysis can leave from the mild and become um, more severe. Difficulty talking or swallowing. And let me see, when people have stroke and they cannot communicate, Sometimes it is even more painful than the stroke itself. But communication is very important. So they will have difficulty talking or swallowing, memory loss, or they will have difficulty thinking. Emotional problems could include like depression and things like those. Pain, there will be pain, numbness, or other unusual sensation. For persons who have uncontrolled diabetes, they tend to have um, itching sensation in the feet, and sometimes it can go to other parts of the body. All right, what are some other things that, we can, that people can do to prevent stroke? So if one knows um, stroke uh, risk factors and one is following one, one's healthcare provider or the doctor, if you are following their recommendation, adopting a healthy lifestyle are the best step one can take to prevent a stroke. So all right, you, you're taking medication, but um, will go thus far, but if you decide to go and fast or to reduce the amount of food that is taken, then you will be moving towards a healthier, a healthier lifestyle. All right. So if somebody was diagnosed with um, ischemic attack. A person should be very careful for the next time. They should even go on more rigorous dieting and exercise than people who are suffering from high blood sugar. And, um, and high blood pressure. So, if somebody has had a stroke, more than likely they will start follow up care in hospital. They will expose you to physiotherapy. They will expose the person to speech therapy and so on. And when they go to their home, those things are continued 
until they get back to their full functioning or as near as possible. All right, so that is my presentation in a nutshell. I could be presenting for two more hours, but um, I condense it for some of the stuff. And that meant for, you know, for persons who are not in the medical field. So we have looked at a definition for um, for stroke. And we say that the stroke occurs when you either you have bleeding in the brain or blockage. And most of most strokes up to 80% are caused by blockage rather than bleeding. So blockage in the brain is easier to deal with than bleeding because bleeding tend to damage the brain tissue faster. and put more pressure on the brain as a whole. And what, they believe, what, they, um, what it does is that it limits oxygen and um, both oxygen and nutrients to the tissues and they gradually die. But if you know that quick action is needed, then if the person gets quick action, they can re regain most of the function. We look at um, where you can have weakened blood vessels that can burst and cause hemorrhage or bleeding. And we look at the type of stroke. We look at the risk factors. Look at some signs and symptoms. And we look at treatment of the different type of um, stroke, how they are treated. We look at some aspect of rehabilitation and recovery. We're going to all of these already. But the good news is that um, people don't have to die and stay um, in a very poor state or fret when they have stroke, all you have to do is work to prevent other stroke and to prevent eventual death, especially at a, a younger age when family might not be grown enough to take care of themselves. So prevention, they say, we have heard that prevention is the best cure. And even today, it is so. I think I am going to stop here. I have reviewed, I've done the lecture and I've reviewed some aspects of it. Comment before the discussion. Thank you very much. Mr. Romain, Bishop Sar. Yes, I have, no, I, have a, I have a question. I have a question, I left you again. Yes, sir. And I am I'm wondering if I hear people talk about the the um high blood pressure and say it can also contribute yes, to stroke. Is there any truth yes. to that? 
Yes, sir. I I, I mentioned it as, as one of, of of the causes, you know. Yeah. That is one of the causes. For instance, let me just go back to it where you have the, the um but 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 while you are while you are doing that, my other question to you is um the blockage and also the bleeding in the in the brain can can lead to stroke. But how how could a person um identify, let's say an untrained mind, how could an untrained mind um identify that look, this is a stroke and um, it's a bleeding stroke or it's a blockage stroke. We couldn't determine that. No. What sign, what, sign should we, what sign should we look for to rush the person to the hospital because to identify that it's a stroke? All right. So what is the sign that you should look for? You will see the twisted face. Each and you know that there were people were talking. They might not be unable, they might be unable to walk, or if they are trying to walk, they can't make it good. Trying to talk, they can't talk good. Um, when they they cannot stand up on their own and those type of things. Okay. They might complain of headache, severe headache, uh, and um, dizziness and those type of things. Okay. And whenever you see those. To hear those things, you should not wait for okay. what type of stroke. The ordinary person can't know that. Ah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And then you need to just rush them to the hospital. Thank you, Elephant. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Um, greetings, Nelwa Fagan. I'm um, Sister Beckford. Greetings, everyone online. Um, as it regards, to, as it regards to a stroke, is it that are there any like first aid treatment, and is it that um, whenever it is that the the face maybe twists, is it twist to the side um, of the brain that is affected, or it twists to the opposite side? So, usually. If it is twisted on the right, is the, 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 the bleeding or the blockage is on the left side. But we say that you have a crossing over of the crossing over somewhere in the above the neck, in the spinal cord, you have a crossing over of the the nervous tract that are leaving out of the brain. So things that happen on the left side affect the right side. Is that sufficient for you? Yes, sir. And is there any like first aid treatment like um All like right. if hmm. All right. I think um I don't think you have any first aid treatment as such to help. So the duty of person to find out would be to rush them to you know to a hospital. But when they go to a hospital, they have to go to to do several tests to see exactly where the blockage is or the bleeding is. And and sometimes out here they can put in what we call a borehole to ease pressure on the brain if there is a lot of bleeding. So those are the things that they can do. But as as to say, give first aid to prevent it from getting worse and so on. Hardly can anybody do that. But what you can do is get them to seek improved care as fast as possible. Okay, thanks, sir. Okay. Great thing, sir. Um, as a follow-up to Sister Damika's question, um, as it relates to, in terms of how it, you treat persons, let's say you identify that somebody has a stroke. Um, I know, for example, like in certain accident scenarios, there are certain ways that you have to move the person in terms of not causing any further damage. 
if someone were to, let's say, you develop that they have a stroke and it's affecting on the left side or what, would it be a recommended to move them to the right side or what do you do in a situation like that? Well, if somebody is having a stroke, there's a possibility that they could, um, um, what we call, they could ingest something down their throat. So during that time, if you are feeding them something, if I hear people say gone on the wrong windpipe. So if you are giving them something to eat and they, they, they have lost function in their the muscles that help to swallow and so on, it could cause problem for them. So maybe you should avoid giving them something to eat at that time. Or since they will not be able to swallow properly. If anything is just a little water. No, I was talking in terms of feeding them with food. Let's I was more so thinking of how you position the person in terms of moving them because you want to okay, all right. okay. to them, but you don't want to further damage what are causing any more problems. All right. So all right. So kind of different from stroke is a bit different from if you have a spinal cord injury, for instance where you would immobilize them but you don't want them to move so much. But I think, um, you know, um, they are, suppose somebody is drooling, when you, when you find them, that's true. You wouldn't want them to be sitting up. You, you would want to turn them to the side where the thing in the mouth can drain out. But um, as to say, they should not assume different position or certain position. I don't think there's any hard and fast rule for that. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, okay. And if I should ask, um, how many persons knew somebody who had a stroke or, or so on? I know that almost every hand would go. But if it is not close relatives, we would know other persons apart from close relatives who have had a stroke. Was the presentation at, at a level where it could be understood or was it? It was perfectly understood, sir. But um, what I wanted to know also, um, the stroke um, specifically um, is associated with a specific age group, or say for in say for instance, you have a a illness like a family illness, like a family trait, and so to say, where maybe your family before had a stroke, and you just have you know, genetics. Is it that um, it affects a certain age group by saying you reach somewhere or it's just based on your dieting and, and how you basically treat your body? All right, very good question. So as it relates to age, I had indicated that persons who are 55 and over are at greater risk of um, having a stroke. Um, when you have certain conditions, for instance, if you have sickle cell anemia, you are at greater risk than the, uh, the average person in the population of getting a stroke. Um, you have some heredity, so strokes can run in family. And um, sometimes family members get it much younger than other members of the, their community. So it is true that age and genetics, just like all genetics affect like diabetes, um, heart disease, and, um, and so the, and such the like, in the same way that it affects um, strokes. Or people who have had a history of stroke, if they, if they have not changed their lifestyle, they 
more stroke and the, the, the more you get stroke, the more deadly they become each time. So management of stroke is a, a big topic. Um, it, it takes different teams of health workers to look after people who are suffering from stroke. After they have had their initial admission, then they need the, the physiotherapist, the occupational therapist, the speech therapist, and all of those persons to help them to prevent getting another stroke. All right, thank you. Um, sir, as you said about getting another stroke, um, is it that it has a little time frame or it still depends on like how you actually treat yourself during the therapy sessions or, or is it that you just have to wait until a certain time frame? Um, let me see if we can go through your questions again. About three questions you, you, you asked. I'm sorry, sir, the, the session is very much interactive and interesting. No, no, I like it, I like it, but I just want to make sure that I respond sensible to what you say. So just repeat the question for me. Okay, um, I was asking as it regards to the stroke itself. So say for instance, where you get a stroke like maybe today, right? Um, you are going maybe in some third position, maybe by next week. Is it that going through or the, the period of going through the therapy sessions, you can actually get another stroke? If it is that you don't like maybe do stuff that you're supposed to be doing, or is it that it, it basically like give you like a time frame before the next one can actually strike again? Well, persons can get who have had strokes can get another one in less than a year from when they got the first one. So um, and especially if you have the disorders that we're talking about here, persons need to be very careful. So the time frame when you will get another stroke, um, only you can depend, can determine that by how much you decide to exercise. Have I answered all the questions now? I have. <laughs> That's it, sir. Thank you so much for your time. Sister Beckford? Beckford? Yes, that's it, sir, for me. Thank you. All right, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Ella Fagan, um, just uh, it's not so much of a question, but I can guess it can be considered a question and a comment in one. Um, um, recently at my workplace, um, there was this manager that, I mean, he, I suspect that he died from a stroke and it was actually on the job instantaneously. Um, what would you say in terms of how we manage even our work life and pressure? Because I you know sometimes, you know, we are always going at it. So the, you might not necessarily be unhealthy in terms of cholesterol and all of those stuff, but even just the fact that you're not getting any rest and so on, does that also give a risk factor to getting a stroke as well? Yes, it is because it is. Um, the body needs re rejuvenation. And if I don't, I don't get my regular sleep, but uh, maybe I can deal with less sleep than a lot of more persons, but you need to get adequate rest and sedentary lifestyle is a big killer of almost any, any condition you can think of, whether hypertension, diabetes, um, and um, obesity. When you are just sitting at that desk, sorry, and you don't even walk a little, if anything, you have your car can drive and so on. 
I remember when I, I when I was not driving, you know, I was slim and trim because I was doing a lot of walking and walking alone. I'm not saying that you mustn't do other exercises, but I say if you do adequate walking, that can take care of all your exercises that you, you need. So stress is a big factor as it relates to heart attack and to stroke. So whether it is a um, physical stress or psycho-emotional stress, they are big factors um, as it relates to stroke. Or the, and as I say, sometimes people are even so taken up with their work that they don't even go and get out, you know. So I have this meeting, I have that meeting, I have this something and I have that one. And your, your schedule is packed from 7.30 in the office to 6.30 in the evening and so on. You think for you to sustain that type of lifestyle um, over time, not easy. So the end result is going to be either a heart attack or a stroke. And when those people get it, as you say, it is so massive that usually recovery is almost impossible sometimes. And it depends on what portion and what part of the brain is um, affected by the stroke or by the bleeding and the the blockage in the in the blood vessel. Okay, I like the discussion. I think we could do with a few more questions before we start. Don't tell me that I was so clear that there is no more question. All right, um, maybe if we should do a survey to find out persons who have known somebody who has passed away because of a, a stroke and we're not talking about the cephalic injury or died the other day. Anybody know any other person who has died, has died from a stroke? Whether it is relative or just friend. Great, greeting, sir. I'm just, I'm just logging on, sir. Just okay. coming to work. But um, I think stroke is a very serious um, situation, sir. I've, I've known several persons who have, you know, passed away, or, you know, by strokes. Or yeah. strokes, strokes slow them up and them wear it. Wear it so, so, I mean, it's a very important topic, sir. I'm just sorry that I wasn't um, online earlier. But um, I'm listening in, sir. God bless you. Uh, okay, Brother Barrington. So as you say, you have known a lot of persons who have succumbed to stroke. And, and you, you know of a lot of others who become unable to carry out their normal function. I heard about Great. a manager, general manager, or CEO of um, National Housing Trust a couple of years ago, who he was at, it, as, at his work like today, and tomorrow he got a massive stroke and couldn't get back his work. So that is how sudden it can be. But like, as, I, as, I, as I emphasize prevention, 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 prevention. If we can um, work on the prevention, then we will be able to overcome stroke. I can so, call the name of um, Elda. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, the thing is, how can you get rid of stress, sir, when 
sometimes you're even stressed and you don't even know. You know? You are so right. You are so right. <laughs> but you know that you don't get rid of stress just like how you don't eradicate poverty. Right. You know the poor will always be with you. So you have to manage stress. We don't talk about getting rid of you. Manage it. Okay. Okay, sir. And, um, by managing stress, you get on top of it. Um, you reduce workload and all of those things. But, so, but how about when you're stress. not when you're not aware? You can never get rid of it. How about when you're not aware, sir? That's the one that I'm afraid of. When you're not aware, well, when, when you're not a, when you're not aware of anything, it will kill you. For instance, yeah. you know that a lot of people, when they find out that they have high blood pressure, is when they just go to the doctor. Right. And they get a blackout and they do a, a test on them, and they realize that they have a high blood pressure. Right. And high blood sugar is the same thing. Well, at least the high blood sugar might have like a warning sign, like you, you're getting up often in the night to pass urine and so But in the other situation of high blood pressure, sometimes you don't know. So the only way you could get that done, you know, uh, by the point time, you would have to get a consultation from like a, a psychologist or psychiatric nurse, social worker, and those type of persons. And they would have to identify what you are suffering from, if you are suffering from something. I'm Elder. This is Brother Richards. Okay, Brother Richards. Yes, my brothers and sisters, pleasant good night to you all. Um, I just want to suggest and ask a few questions and, um, and the, the, the strokes thing, because as my brother just spoke just a moment ago, saying about you know a few persons you know i share the same sentiment because i had i has had two friends who passed away from that and i had i has another friend who are who are suffering from it as well but one one of two that passed away out of the two um he was having a little relationship problem and um because of the relationship between he and um his partner and then got separated so he took up drinking for it i myself spoke with him over the time because we used to you know drive truck back there in the states for rooms to go and he was a good friend of mine as we all from jamaica <clears throat> yeah. sorry so, so what happened um I try to talk to him, talk him out of it. You know, sometimes when I call him, you know, he's at home crying and stuff like that. I try to give him my moral support without the part of friends in from Jamaica, but then, so what really happened? You know, he kind of cut the crying off and stuff like that. And um, I remember I bought this book. The topic was power over stress. And um, I lent it to somebody, and that book got messed mess up. So what happened? No, what my friend? No, I talk him out of the, you know, the drinking, and uh, he was hiding and drinking just the same. And when one time I saw him on the street, he said, "No, no, no, he's cool and stuff like that." But I tried to go close to some smell the, the alcohol on him, but he had a, a tactics to him. He always have some mint in his mouth. I don't know. If, if he sends me close by or saw me come in or do something. However, I oftentimes say to him, listen, man, you are putting yourself to a stop sign. And eventually, having me here in Jamaica, I get the sad news that he um, get the first jokes, and uh, which is a minor, a mild one, so to speak. The second one was a minor, and the third one, it goes. He passed on. The second one that had this, the second one that had the stroke, the strokes. He had get fired from his work, and um, 
but I was told that there was some some dishonesty in his work and um, they had found some stolen goods at his premises, which is back here in Jamaica. And, um, and um, he went to the court and back and forth and the court was going on and so forth. I saw him after I heard about everything, I went and I met with him. I sat him down and we, we had a brief talk for a good while one day. And um, he, he said, well, then um, he don't know how he can cope with it because, you know, no salary coming in and he had to go dip in his um, savings and stuff like that. His girlfriend got pregnant and so I said, listen, all of this, what you are telling me about, do not put it on your head. If you put all of it, it's going to be a heavy load and you cannot manage that load. And he came. We keep talking, 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 and um, till one day I saw him coming from the hospital, and it, it took him about an hour and a half to get out of that car. And I said to him, "Look at what you are doing to yourself, bro." And um, next thing, later months, down the line, I heard that he passed away. This other one that is living right now, he gets a second stroke, which is an um. His right side, his right side, yeah, this one is on his right side. And um, he's a guy who smoke a lot, you know, especially uh, that dirty tobacco. And um, having smoking the tobacco, they had a thing called, um, this style of drinking has some little alcohol mix up, mix up two or three different alcohol in a cup, half cup of alcohol, and they just sip it, like they just tip it to their tongues and all of that. And one day I said to him, listen, man, I've been inviting you to church all along. You make a promise. I said, all of this, what you are doing, is not good. However, however, his daughter, his daughter, both of them, um, got this, some disagreement along the line, and he put that on his head. Because as Carter, he said he loved his daughter so much. And I said to him, give her some time. But, um, you know, some people, as you mentioned, Elder, before, that you have to manage, manage. stress. If you, go, if you cannot manage stress, just as if you cannot manage your business or, or your, your, your salary, whatever, or your home, it's going to be a little strain on you. So... Those, those guys, they cannot manage. Even myself, sometimes, sometimes a little thing may come to mind and I, I, I'm running a little difficulty. And I said to myself, come on, Chris, you have to stand above all of this. You have to be firm, you have to focus. These are just things of the world. So if you cannot manage, or you call upon God and say, Father, take this in hand for me. This is too much for me you're going to bring on a lot of stress on yourself. Okay, so and, I took a little um, time now to respond. Yes, Pastor. You mentioned, you mentioned two of your friends, and both of them had lifestyle. That yes, they were not yes. Managing. Because drinking is one of the worst things um, as it relates to effect upon the blood vessel. Yeah. The drinking makes the blood vessels become calcified. That means they become hardened. And, um, yeah. They cannot stretch as they do. <clears throat> Smoking does the same thing. So yes. people who are involved in those things are going to put more pressure on themselves and will eventually um, get a stroke. Or a heart attack. So Absolutely. those things that can be avoided should be avoided. And you know that if you don't if you don't learn your lesson, you might have to pay the price twice. Exactly. And that that is what happened to your friend. Although people were encouraging them to stop of the drinking, but they, they were going to, when they wanted to drown their sorrow that type of thing. <laughs> and it never That's true. 
Yeah. Uh, well okay, so um, stress factors will increase the possibility of getting stroke. Um, if you drink, it will um, increase the risk of stroke. And smoking, as I say, all of those. We know that those are not church people activity, but nevertheless, and you know one thing about smoking. If you were smoking for for twenty years and then you quit, all of your risks don't go away, you know, because remember, you had twenty years in which you were abusing it. So. Only the risk that will develop from here on until now, but those that you have, uh, if I use the term, those that you have acquired, they will not go away. So the blood vessels started to, to clog up. But the good thing is that now you, are, you have stopped clogging up as it used to because you have no reduced salt, fat in your diet. So, but you will have residual. Every year you live, it will get less, but that is how risk factors go. All right, again, thank you for your attention and your participation, it was very lively. Anybody with any final question or any final comment? Elder Fagan, um, as we're talking about, um, you know, persons who know persons who have um, had a stroke, um, I, I knew a friend, when she took the COVID vaccine, she got a mild stroke. Um, I'm not sure if it is, but it's as she got the vaccine, so she got the stroke. So I would like to know, is it that the based on medication that you take, it can give you stroke, or um, is it maybe the medication with your lifestyle combination that gives stroke? Because she's going therapy you now, uh, as it regards to the stroke. So, you see, that is one thing to prove causation. Could it be a coincidence that as soon as she got it, she had the stroke, or is it really the vaccine that caused it? You see what I'm saying, Sister Beckford? So yes, sir, but it's, it's, just, it's right sometimes it is a vaccine. perception. Oh. I'm saying that sometimes, sometimes it could be a perception rather than reality. That um, as soon as she got the, remember what they were saying about Michael Sharp and so, the former yes. radio and TV announcer. As a matter of fact, they were threatening some health workers to say that uh, as soon as Michael went and took the vaccine, he got um, COVID and and it reached a stage that he never recover and get worse and worse until he finally died when they were planning to threaten healthcare workers. But the family members came out and said he had underlying um, issues and they don't want any blame to be leveled on health workers. So sometimes people might have had underlying issues, you know, and then as soon as they, they take the vaccine, the, the, the issue does pop up a little more. I am looking at those possibilities, but um, to establish causation, to say that you have to eliminate a whole heap of other things, rather than to say that it, if you even say it contributed, that would even be a better thing rather than to say it caused it. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ella Fagan, for an excellent presentation tonight. And thanks to everyone who 
participated um, by asking a question or two are also fielding comments to the presentation that was made. At this time, I'll hand over to our pastor who will give the closing and other remarks, and then we will close off after, of course, persons have greeted each other. God bless you all. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you again, Sister okay. Rumi. Thanks, Stella Fagan, for your time and your knowledge. And I think this is what we need now um, in, the, in the disciples. Um, there was Luke, who was a medical person, because we are, some people at right. times believe that we are spirit. We are not spirit. We are flesh and blood, right? Oh, yeah. We are flesh and blood. Angels are yeah. fully spirit. We are filled with the spirit of God, but we are flesh and blood. And we are subject. The yeah. flesh is corruption. It is subject to all the ills around. Obi hit, we can be healed by the stripes of the Lord. But the only reason why we are healed is because we were sick. Now, so we need to um, take heed, learn from those who have the, the skill, the knowledge that can impart to us. And this is a new trend that we are going on. At Greenwich Road, we believe that we have people with the requisite skills in different areas that can help us to develop our, our theme this year for convention, sorry, not for convention, but for our strategic plan and operation plan is um, is growth and development, spiritual growth and development. So we need, we want to grow, but we also want to develop. Otherwise, we just grow like a bamboo tree, and we can't take any weight. We don't want it that way. All right. So we want to our soul or to prosper as our soul prosper. God bless you again, everyone, and we'll be back here on. And let me put this way to you, if you didn't hear yet, every Tuesday night, we'll have different presenters and different presentation in different forms, which we don't know. When we come, we'll hear what it's all about. All right? You can't take any form. It's up to the discretion of the presenters. All right? God bless you. God bless you. Let's bow our heads at this time. Eternal God and our Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for your blessing to us. We thank you. Lord, for your instruction, Lord Jesus, to pass on to us. Oh, God, we dispense in such a clear and concise way. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the presenter. And we thank you, Lord, for us that are edified by the presentation. Bless us, we pray, Lord, for we ask these verses in Jesus' name. Lord, bless you and keep you. Lord, make this face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, lift up his countenance upon you give you peace. Let all of you say, Amen. Amen. Amen.